Darkcast Network. Welcome to the dark side of podcasting. While I am gone, remember, everyone is together in thoughts and prayers and time passes quickly. Have faith in me, yourself, everyone. That was just part of a cryptic note that 23-year-old Leah Roberts left her roommate before she packed up and headed out on a journey of self-discovery. On March 9, 2000, Leah set off from her home in Raleigh, North Carolina, and headed west, following the footsteps of her literary hero, Jack Kerouac. The idea of a spontaneous trip fit in with Leah's adventurous spirit, so no one was initially concerned, despite the fact that she hadn't mentioned this trip to anyone. But as days passed without word, Leah's siblings reported her missing. Five days later, her sister Kara got a shocking message. Leah's Jeep Cherokee had been found wrecked at the bottom of a ravine in Whatcom County, Washington. All of Leah's belongings were found at the accident scene, but Leah was nowhere to be found. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell you the stories of those who never came home. Today, I want to tell you the story of Leah Roberts. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us once again, and welcome to season five. Oh my god, I can't believe we've been doing this. For I this know. Long. I mean, this a new season doesn't really mean that much because uh, you know the, the we seasons just make are, up the seasons yeah, as we go. They're pretty wise. arbitrary. Yeah, I just kind of generally break them down by year, but that means that this is we're going into our fifth year of having this podcast. That's wild. Yeah, I cannot believe that it's lasted this long. So anyway, I am Kona, if you're new here. And I'm Ethan. And we're the husband and wife team behind this podcast. Each week, I tell you the story of an unsolved missing persons case. Ethan doesn't know anything about the case going into the episode, and he is here to provide his reactions and questions in real time, hopefully asking some of the same ones you have at home. Hopefully. Hopefully. (laughs) Now, before we get started this week, I want to shout out a few people who have joined us over on Patreon. So thank you so much to Sammy S., Susan S., and Sabrina C. Thank you guys so much. Yes, thank you for your support. And as a reminder, you can get episodes early and ad-free by subscribing to our Patreon at any level. You can also get ad-free episodes by subscribing to us on Apple Podcasts. And now with that out of the way, let's get into the first case of the year, Leah Roberts. Leah Toby Roberts was born on July 23rd, 1976 in Durham, North Carolina to Nancy and Stancil Roberts. Leah is the youngest of three children. She has an older sister, Kara, and an older brother, Heath. There isn't a lot of information out there about their upbringing, but, you know, it just seems to have been a pretty average suburban Southern life. Leah was bright and creative and curious about the world around her. She had plans to attend college, but they were nearly derailed at 17 when her father was diagnosed with a chronic lung condition. Oh, like COPD or something? Yeah, they never specify what it was, but it seemed as though that it it was something that like really affected him and it was it was tough for him to do the things that he used to do. And so I think Leah struggled with, you know, possibly leaving for college or staying home and helping the family and you know money may have been a concern Mm -hmm. so yeah it was it was tough and you know when you're 17 and getting ready to kind of start your life in a way like it's tough to to deal with something like that happening to a parent yeah for sure but he remained stable enough that in 1995 leah did enter north carolina state university Located only about 25 miles away in Raleigh, the choice in schools allowed Leah to remain close to her family. True to form, once at college, Leah pursued studies in anthropology and Spanish. 
two subjects that would allow her to navigate the world and learn its secrets. Lee's first year went well, but during her sophomore year, she was dealt a devastating blow when her mother died suddenly of a heart attack. Oh, man, that's really tough. Yeah, because, I mean, from all accounts, it seems that her mom was relatively healthy and, you know, doing fine. And it was her dad who was sick. And then her mother just had a heart attack. And so her father was still ill, but... After taking some time off to grieve, Leah did return to school the next fall in 1998. Unfortunately, her return was short-lived. Leah was driving her car one day that fall, like the first semester of school, when a tractor trailer pulled out in front of her. So she was in a huge car accident with a tractor trailer, which resulted in Leah suffering from a punctured lung and a shattered femur. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's horrible. Yeah, her leg was broken so badly that they had to put a metal rod in. Jesus. After the accident, Leah told her sister Kara that she had thought she was going to die and felt born again. She wanted to take advantage of every opportunity and live her life to the fullest. So after her recovery, which I'm sure, you know, took a while, she did return to college once again. Leah also began to travel and spent several months studying abroad in Spain. In the spring of 1999, she was gearing up for a field program in Costa Rica. But three weeks before she was scheduled to leave, Leah was rocked by yet another tragic event. I mean, what next? The death of her father. Oh, my God. Yeah. So she lost both of her parents while she was in college. Wow. That's terrible. Mm hmm. And then, you know, and having car to accident. Yeah, deal with her own physical recovery in addition to grieving and trying to get through college. I mean, I can't imagine what it must have been like to have just one thing after the other happen to you like that. But, you know, that last tragedy was seemingly the straw that broke the camel's back as everything began to change for Leah after that. Hopefully in a positive way. I mean, yeah, you can look at it that way. It, it's it's basically, <laughs> I think by then she was just kind of done with school, like done with kind of yeah the traditional path that she was on. So she did go on her planned field program in Costa Rica, um, you know, which again was only three weeks after her dad passed away. And according to a 2011 episode of Disappeared on her case, Leah didn't really seem like she was mourning her father while she was gone. It was almost as if she was compartmentalizing the tragedy. Mm, Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And she's just kind of in denial. Yeah. And which I get like, because again, like, how can you take one more thing? Right. Like, I can completely understand just saying, you know, not going to deal, can't deal with that right now. Just going to put that in a box somewhere and yeah, uh, go to Costa Rica. It's not, and it, but it's not like this Costa Rica trip was like a vacation or something. Yeah. She had to go at this certain time. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense to put everything else on the back burner mentally. Yeah. Yes, for sure. After she returned, however, you know, she did begin to process the loss and she began to become more interested in spirituality. She also seemed to decide that life was short and it was time to do what she wanted and college no longer fit into that plan. Despite the fact that it was her senior year, Leah didn't heed her siblings' pleas to just stick it out for a few more months. And she officially dropped out of college. And I get that. Like, it's like she's been through so much. She kept on coming back. It's just like, oh, my God, you have like four months left or whatever it was. I can understand being the older sibling and just going, oh, my gosh, please just finish. Just finish. You're so close. Yeah. But I also get why Leah was like, no, (laughs) like, I'm not into it. I can't imagine doing another semester and studying for finals and everything else that goes along with school. Yeah. Having just gone through all of these tragedies. Right. And like, you know, doing that thing where you're like going to job fairs and, you know, all of that senior year stuff. It's like, who cares? Right. Leah had some money that she had inherited from her parents, like not a ton. But again, we're talking the year 2000 in Raleigh, North Carolina. Like you did not need a lot of money to live. Mm -hmm. I mean, she had a roommate you know, not not to be all back in my day, because she's only a couple of years older than us. But I mean, I rented a full one bedroom college apartment junior year. So 2001, basically, mm-hmm. for $375 a month. <laughs> and it was across the street from campus. 
Yeah, I guess Penn State was a little bit more expensive. Though. Yeah, I don't know. But I was at JMU, so I was in Virginia. You know, we're kind of... But like, my point is, is that she wasn't like rich or anything, but she lived simply. She, you know, wasn't mm-hmm. doing extravagant things. And so she just was able to afford to just take some time. And that's what she did. Like, she spent her days learning to play guitar and reading. She began to frequent a local cafe, Cup of Joe, where she read works by Jack Kerouac and other beat poets. She wrote her own poetry and she journaled. She also took up photography and adopted a cat named B. <laughs> and that's B-E-A, like B. Arthur. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know if that's what she named him at, her after, but in my mind, she did. So Leo was clearly in a self-discovery era. You remember that time, you know, in your early 20s when you're leaving the safety of college and it feels like your actual life is about to begin? Yeah. So that's where Leah was. She was particularly obsessed with Kerouac's The Dharma Bums, his semi-autographical follow-up to On the Road. In it, he talks about working alone as a fire lookout on Desolation Peak in Whatcom County, Washington. Though the solo adventure is romanticized in that book, Kerouac would later write in Desolation Angels that this time was actually terribly lonely and boring. But it was the idealized version that was in Leah's head in 2000. On March 9th, Leah spoke on the phone with her sister Kara, as she often did. According to Kara, it was a typical phone call absent of any red flags. They made plans to see each other soon and hung up. Leah also made plans with her roommate, Nicole, to help her babysit the next day. But apparently, she had no intention of actually keeping those plans. Instead, on the afternoon of March 9th, Leah withdrew $3,000 in cash from her bank account, packed some belongings in her car, put B in a cat carrier, and left North Carolina without a word. The next day, March 10th, Leah failed to show up to that babysitting gig, but Nicole just assumed Leah forgot, which, you know, again, she didn't have much of a schedule, so. (laughs) Yeah, right. But then Leah didn't come home. After a day or so, other friends started calling because Leah had missed plans with them as well. And again, this is 2000, so I'm assuming that the apartment just had a landline. Yeah. I mean, cell phones did exist, but they were not very popular right and it wasn't now and even if you did have a cell phone like most people still had a landline that they like normally used right you know it's not that the friends were calling nicole they were just calling the apartment trying to get leah and leah just wasn't there yeah by march 12th leah or her car hadn't been seen in three days and that's when nicole began to worry and it's tough, you know, because on one in a lot of cases, you're like, oh, my God, nobody reported her missing for three days. But it's like she's a college student who right. had dropped out of college, right. didn't have a job like she was an adult. You know, it's perfectly reasonable to think that she just like took off and was staying with a boyfriend or went back to see her sister or whatever and didn't say anything. But didn't you say she left a note? Yes, but they didn't see the note at this time okay yeah so she nicole did not yet know about the note all she knew is that she hadn't seen leah so then nicole called kara leah's sister to see if you know leah was there if she knew what was going on but of course she didn't so then the pair of them started calling around to everyone they knew but no one had any idea where leah was Kara went to Leah's apartment the next day to take a look around and see if she could figure out what had happened to her sister. When she searched Leah's room, she saw that a lot of clothes and belongings were missing, which made her think that Leah had just left voluntarily. Yeah, exactly. Nicole didn't search her room because they're just roommates. Like, and it's not cool to like go searching through somebody's room, but Kara's the big sister. Like, right. Yeah. You can toss the place, (laughs) I feel like, at that point, you know? So even though it did appear that Leah, like, decided to take a trip, Kara was still concerned just due to Leah's overall mental health and everything that she had been going through lately. So she did call police that day and reported her sister missing. 
Now, the next day, March 14th, Kara went back to the apartment and searched Leah's room again, like just hoping to find something that she missed that could give her some clue as to like where Leah was. And she did find something. She found the, the note. note. Oh, yeah. Okay. So it, it's so weird to me because the note was on Leah's dresser, addressed to Nicole. Right. But like she didn't leave it in a place where Nicole would have seen it. Yeah. Because again, Le- like Nicole's not going to go into her room and like, oh, I wonder if she left me a note like in her room. That's that's a little weird. Yeah. yeah right. And it must have been, I don't know if it was like under stuff, you know, because Kara didn't even find it the first day. Right. But anyway, so the the note, like I said, was to Nicole. It was dated March 9th, which was the last day she was seen. And in it was enough cash to cover about a month's worth of expenses. For the apartment? For the apartment, oh. yeah. So like her portion of the rent, you know, utilities, whatever else. Yeah, yeah. The note read in part, quote, this is to cover bills for while I am gone. Remember, everyone is together in thoughts and prayers and time passes quickly. Have faith in me yourself, end quote. Then there's a small section off to the side that's circled and says April 23rd on the road. Then it says, quote, no, I'm not suicidal. I am the opposite. Remember Jack Kerouac, end quote. But Kerouac is spelled (laughs) K-E-R-O-W-A-C-K. Okay. (laughs) Which, I mean, she did, I think, as like a joke or, you know, whatever. Like, but yeah, so like Kerouac. So this note is like literally all over the place. It's like there's the main body of the note and then there are different asides and things just written in smaller writing kind of like on the sides and in the margins and stuff like it's and it's on a blue sky stationary. Like there's a lot going on with this. And I actually haven't been able to find like the full like a picture of the full note. Mm. I've only been able to find like a an excerpt that somebody screen grabbed from the episode of Disappeared. So I can't read like the entire thing. But there's another section on it that says something that looks like help Shep with Easter. And I don't know if Shep. Shep. Yeah, I don't know if that's what that says. She she had, I couldn't quite read the handwriting, but it looks like something like that. But it's helped somebody with Easter. Mm. Now, Easter 2000 that year was on April 23rd, which is the date that she had put by the, like, I'm not suicidal on the opposite part of the note. So Easter is kind of like a recurring theme within this note. Mm -hmm. If Easter is April 23rd, she's leaving on March 9th, then it would indicate that if Leah did plan on coming back, it likely wouldn't be until May at the earliest. If she's asking Nicole to help somebody with Easter, then that tells me that she wasn't planning on being there herself. Right, but she only left enough money for one month. Yeah, but so I'm thinking that month would have been April because it's March 9th. So oh, I would right. assume that Everything's she paid. Yeah, for March. Yeah. So I would assume that this would have been April's money and gotcha. then maybe she would be planning on coming back in May. Or another, you know, idea is, "Hey, I'm taking off. I'm not coming back, but I I don't want to completely screw you over. So mm. like here's stuff for at least a month and then sorry, you're going to have to figure the rest of it out." Mm, yeah, maybe. You know, I, I, we don't know. Like, I think it could, it could be either. And, but part of the reason why I do think that maybe she was planning on being away for like longer than a month or not coming back is because apparently, and again, I haven't seen this. I've only read uh, about this. That in other sections of the note, she also said that there were cookies in the freezer, and she offered her room and laptop for other people to use. Hmm. I mean, maybe she's the type of person who she was going to be gone for a month was just like, hey, if anybody needs my room, if anybody needs to, you know, to use my laptop, tell them to go for it. Or is this more of a like, I'm not coming back. You can use my room and my laptop. Yeah. (laughs) You know? Right. The outside of the note also had a drawing of the Cheshire cat from Alice in Wonderland, which many seem to believe indicates that like the cat, Leah intended on mysteriously disappearing and reappearing. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) I think that might be a stretch. I don't know. I mean, maybe. I don't know. Like, You think that there's that much uh, meaning to the symbols? I think it could be. I mean, I think she's the type of person just based on like what she was reading and like getting into spirituality and just everything that was going on with her. I can see her putting kind of symbols and things, but mm. I don't know. Maybe she just, maybe it's like you with that bird that you always draw. Maybe she just knows how to like draw one thing and she just drew the Cheshire cat. That's right. <laughs> 
Now, unsurprisingly, the missing persons report that Kara filed wasn't being taken incredibly seriously by police. Well, I'm sure, especially after that note was found. Well, yeah, right? It just looks like she decided to take off, like, and she was fine. So luckily for Kara, however, who, you know, obviously still wanted to know where her sister was, Leah had granted her power of attorney before that Costa Rica trip. So Kara was able to access Leah's bank account. Oh, okay. Yeah. So she was able to get in. And in doing that, she found that Leah had made it to Lebanon, Tennessee on March 10th and stayed in a hotel there. Now, Lebanon is about 500 miles due west of Raleigh on I-40. And the drive would have taken her around eight hours. The next charge on her credit card was a gas purchase further west on I-40. On March 13th at 1257 a.m., surveillance video captured Leah at a gas station in Brooks, Oregon. They pulled the footage based on her bank account. So basically, Kara found the charge and said that I don't know when this was, um, but they contacted the gas station and said, hey, can you pull surveillance, blah, blah, blah. And they found her. She's wearing a wide brimmed hat. She looks totally fine. So at this point, like, I'm sure the police are like, all right, like, this is not a missing person. She's out doing her own thing. Yeah. I mean, because she she's just like at a gas station buying snacks in Oregon, you know? The only weird thing about the surveillance video, which was shown on that episode of Disappeared, is that while she's at the counter checking out, like she just looks out the door several times. And it, it does look like she's waiting for somebody or looking for somebody or keeping an eye on someone. But she does it several times in a very short period. Mm. So it is a little strange. But unfortunately, that gas station didn't have outdoor surveillance cameras. So we have no idea like what or who she was looking at. So this was, you know, early in the morning on March 13th, right? So it took her about like three and a half days to get to Oregon. Mm -hmm. But Kara is not finding this out in real time, you know. Right. So she's already. She's behind. Yeah, she's behind on this. So around March 13th, March 14th, you know, Kara's still trying to figure everything out. She did know that she was going west based on that hotel um, charge in Tennessee, but she didn't know where exactly she was heading, where her final destination was. So she started just asking around Raleigh, like, you know, trying to find people who knew Leah to see if anybody knew anything. If like she had said, oh, yeah, I'm going to take this trip, like whatever. She ended up at Cup of Joe and met Janine Quiller, who was one of Leah's friends who she had met there. Janine told Kara that the two had talked about beat poetry and just taking off on a road trip. She later said on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, quote, from the last conversation that we had, we were talking about Dharma bums and about how Kerouac was up on Desolation Peak, just taking in all the beauty around him, end quote. Kara now had a better idea of where her sister could have been heading, and she would soon sadly be proven right. On March 18th, a couple was jogging on Canyon Creek Road, which was a logging road off of Mount Baker Highway in Whatcom County, Washington, about 100 miles away from Desolation Peak, when they noticed something strange. Some sources say that they saw articles of clothing hanging on trees on the side of the road, while others say that the clothing was tied to the trees. Mm. In any case, Clothing, you know, in trees was very weird. And so this caused the couple to pause. And when they looked down the embankment by where the clothing was, they found a crashed white Jeep Cherokee. The couple called it in and the Jeep was eventually tied to Leah's North Carolina missing persons report. Though they had found her Jeep, Leah was nowhere to be found. So I'm just going to play an excerpt from the Disappeared episode in which they explain the weird circumstances around this crash. It looked like the vehicle went somewhere between 30 to 40 miles per hour. Um, It was going uphill. Investigators are able to determine the speed, judging from the damage done to the trees as the Jeep tumbled over the embankment. It sheared off some trees that were three to four inches around. And then it looked like it tossed. It went end over end and then side to side. Everything in the vehicle was being tossed out of the vehicle. So if someone was in it, it would have been uh, severely uh, injured. 
or if they're tossed out, you'd expect them to have been somewhere near the vehicle. Despite what appeared to be a serious crash, there was no evidence of injury inside the car. No blood, no seatbelt strain, nothing. Did they say that the they determined that the car was going uphill? Yeah. When it went over the embankment? Yep, it was going uphill. Hmm. Which even when we get into further oddities about this crash, like, is still weird. Yeah. So that indicates to me that it'd be really difficult for her to stage that if it's going uphill. It's not like she can just be outside of the car pushing it into the ravine if the car's going uphill. Yeah, but we're going to talk more about that later. Okay. Oh, so the other thing that was weird when investigators got down and they're taking a look at the Jeep is that, okay, so when the car crashed, like he said in the clip, it kind of went end over end, right? Mm -hmm. The windows blew out. Yeah. Right. Like all the side windows were gone, which makes total sense. But there were like blankets and pillowcases and stuff in where the windows were. So, meaning like they were closed in the door to kind of create a cover mm. where where the windows would have been. And so it looked to them like somebody had been using the crashed Jeep as shelter. Mm. Which would make sense if, you know, you're in a bad car accident, you're injured. You, you know, can't like, let's say, you know, your leg's broken, like whatever, you can't walk, you can't get up the embankment. So you make a makeshift shelter in your car and, you know, wait for help to come. But again, there's no evidence that she was in there. And to me, okay, like the lack of blood is big, obviously, because with all that broken glass, yeah, you know, even if it's a minor car accident, you would think that there would be blood from just getting cut. Mm hmm. But this was a major car accident, so no blood, but then also no seatbelt strain, meaning that it didn't appear that the driver had been wearing a seatbelt at the time, which if you're not wearing a seatbelt in a crash like that, like there's no way there won't be blood. Right. Or you'll get tossed completely out of the car. Exactly. Which again, like he kind of said in the clip, like you would just expect to see that person nearby. Right. Or signs that they had... Because if you're getting ejected through a windshield, like you're not just dusting yourself off and walking away. Mm -hmm. Adding to the disturbing nature of this discovery was the fact that all of Leah's important personal possessions were found inside of the crashed car, well, and around the crashed car, because a lot of stuff did, you know, get tossed from the car. But they were able to recover her driver's license, passport, credit card, checkbook, her guitar, her CDs, and $2,400 in cash. Can I ask something? Mm -hmm. Where's the cat? So they found cat food and they found the cat carrier. But no cat. No bee. Once the Jeep was found, the search for Leah kicked into high gear. Karen Heath both traveled to Washington to assist in any way possible. A search and rescue team was immediately dispatched and helicopters were used for an aerial search. They searched for two weeks and, you know, they searched in the ravine where the Jeep was found. They searched on the road that the Jeep would have gone off of. Like they searched the entire immediate area, but no trace of Leah or any other injured person was ever found. Hmm. However, once the Jeep was, you know, taken to a secure facility and searched more thoroughly, another upsetting discovery was made. Underneath the driver's side floor mat, they found Leah's mother's engagement ring. Now, this is something that Leah had been given, I believe, after her mother's death, but she never took it off. Like, it was a sacred object to her. So the fact that she didn't have it added another layer of concern. And it was underneath a floor mat? Yeah, the driver's side floor mat. So, like, clearly purposely placed there. Yeah, it doesn't seem as though it would have just ended up there by accident. Another item found in the Jeep also led to a new line of inquiry and a new location to search. Police found a movie ticket stub to a 210 showing of American Beauty on March 13th. The theater was located in a mall in Bellingham, Washington, about 30 miles away from the crash site. What we know of her timeline now is that at around 12.57 a.m. on March 13th, she was in Oregon at that gas station. Right. But then I believe it said that the ticket was purchased around like 1 p.m. And it was for a 210 showing was it, in Bellingham, Washington. Was the ticket stub torn? 
as though yeah. she had so she had yeah, gone into in, the movie. Yeah, it did indicate that she had gone into the movie. Investigators and Leah's siblings went to Bella's Fair Mall to see what they could find out. They handed out missing persons flyers, hoping to run into somebody who had noticed Leah that day. During this, Kara noticed a restaurant in the mall that seemed like the type of place Leah would go. Sure enough, staff members remembered seeing her on the 13th. Mm. Leah came into the restaurant and sat at the bar for lunch. According to that episode of Disappeared, there had been two men sitting at the bar on either side of Leah. She didn't appear to have known either of them, but she struck up conversations with both. Remarkably, police were able to identify and ended up speaking with both of these men. Uh, wow. How? How, how well, did they find them? So I don't know how they ended up finding the second guy, but the first guy called in. Oh. So once he saw like the news, you know, and, and Leo was on there and he's like, oh, shit, like, I think that's the person that I sat next to at this bar. So he just called in the tip. Oh. Yeah, and so he said that Leah had been friendly and chatted with him and the other man before leaving the restaurant alone, presumably to go to the movie. When police spoke with the second man, which again, I don't know how they found him because he didn't call in. Like, they had to track him down. But this second man said basically the same thing about chatting with Leah and said that she talked about Jack Kerouac, which, you know, seems pretty legit. Right. However, his story diverges from the first man's in a pretty important way. He claimed that Leah didn't leave alone, but that she left with a third guy named Barry. And where did he come from? No idea. So, But this man was able to describe Barry in detail, and a composite sketch was made, and they circulated it. And so this, you know, again, comes from that episode of Disappeared, and it's never explained how the second man knew that the mystery man who Leah left with was named Barry. Like they never actually talk about where this guy came from. If he was also in the restaurant somewhere, or if like he came in and Leah just left with him, like he doesn't explain it at all. Hmm. Police were also suspicious because the first man who said Leah left alone called the tip in, you know, like I said, but they had to track down the second man. So they were kind of inclined to believe the first guy and thought that the second one was a little sketchy. But why would he why would he make that up? I don't know. Police early on, like at that point, didn't entirely believe that Barry existed, Mm. but they just couldn't rule anything out. Like it was just so early in the investigation that they were just like, I don't know, maybe there's a Barry. Like he gave a really good description. Let's just show this sketch and see if anybody pops up. So at this point, police didn't know for sure if Leah had left alone or with some guy. She had the ticket stub, which, you know, did seemingly indicate that she made it to the movie. Mm -hmm. But according to Kara, no one who worked at the theater specifically remembered seeing her. Then another strange tip was called in. A week after Leah's car was found, police received an anonymous tip from a man claiming to have seen a woman matching Leah's description at a Texaco gas station in Everett, Washington, about 60 miles south of Bellingham on I-5. He said that the woman appeared disoriented. But when asked for more information, the man hung up and police have never been able to identify him. So are we thinking that's a red heron or? I I don't know. I mean, I'm wondering if it's like a completely new person or if it's like guy number two calling in a tip or if it's Barry calling in a tip or if it's guy number one calling in a tip or or if, you know, it's just a random person who did see Leah or if it's a random person who just saw somebody else. Like, I have no idea. And how far away from the crash site would this have been? Well, it's 60 miles south of Bellingham. And so it's it's about 60 miles. So Bellingham is near, like, that's in Whatcom County, which is where the crash site was. So it's, like, in that general vicinity. 60 and, miles is a long way. Yeah. And that sighting, you know, apparently happened after the crash. So the idea is that Leah survived the crash, but was perhaps disoriented and made it 60 miles away somehow. That's kind of what Kara was going with. She and Heath started to believe that Leah could have sustained some sort of head injury in the car crash and had either wandered off or hitchhiked. But then where's B? Where's the cat? I don't know. No idea. 
And but they're thinking maybe she doesn't even know who she is. So like maybe she was alive and well somewhere, but was suffering from something like disassociative amnesia, as we talked about in the Lawrence Bader case. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps she had hitchhiked and someone took advantage of her disoriented state and harmed her. Mm. The alleged Texaco sighting was the last big clue in Leah's case. The search for Barry never went anywhere, and eventually her case went cold. And that's how it remained for several years until 2006, when the detective assigned to Leah's case retired, and it was given to a new team with fresh eyes. The new detectives, Collins and Smith, went over all of the evidence they had, most notably Leah's Jeep. The Jeep had been kept in that secured facility over the years in hopes that advances in technology would uncover new evidence. Wow, that's uh, surprising. Yeah, so they didn't release the car. They just kept it in, you know, whatever garage or whatever, just hoping that eventually they'd be able to find out more. And right off the bat, the detectives did find out important information that the car had never been fully processed. Oh, God, really? Yeah. They had never opened the hood. What? Yeah. This car apparently drove off of an embankment and they never thought to say like, huh, I wonder what's going on in there. What the hell? Luckily, the new detectives did. And in 2007, they went in and examined the engine. Once they did this, all of their theories were put into question. According to Detective Smith on that episode of Disappeared, the cover on the starter relay had been removed, which, according to him, would make it possible for someone to turn the ignition on, so like turn the key, push the starter relay, and have the vehicle accelerate on its own, meaning that somebody could crash the Jeep without anyone inside. Going back to your first question about it being uphill and making that hard to stage. So, yeah, it's not a situation where Leah could start the car, somehow put it in drive and then like push it down the hill. But presumably this would give it more power and it could go uphill. I don't know. I don't know. Either. I don't know anything about cars. And I will say that like there's, you know, a Reddit thread about this case that I read where a lot of people are arguing that like. That isn't how cars work, and that wouldn't allow you to to make the car accelerate on its own. But I don't know. So I, I don't know either. Yeah, I, and again, in in this, I I have to say, like this information is already coming to a second hand, right? Because it's coming from the detective. It's not coming from whatever mechanic determined this. So right. he's explaining something that was explained to him, and right. who and he, knows how he, much he knows about cars? Exactly. And, yeah, you know. So I I take the explanation with a grain of salt, because that might not be exactly what was actually going on with the car. Mm -hmm. But it does seem as though the car was tampered with in some way, which I think is the important takeaway. Right. And that does certainly fit in with the lack of evidence of driver injury. Because again, if this is what happened, it couldn't have been an accident. So then the question is, was it her tampering with it with the car? Right. To stage the accident so that she could disappear, or was it somebody else? That's a good question because it does seem as though whoever tampered with it would have to have had mechanical knowledge. Right. And from what it sounds like, Leah didn't. Yeah. Like she didn't know. Like nobody thought, like, oh, yeah, Leah would have known how to do this. So everybody immediately believed that it was somebody, somebody else. else. Yeah. Who tampered with her car, but then why? But interestingly enough, the second man from the restaurant, who the original detectives had been suspicious of, happened to have been a mechanic with a military background. Mm. In the course of the reinvestigation of the Jeep, police also found fingerprints underneath the hood that, of course, hadn't been documented in the original investigation. The second man from the restaurant had moved to Canada in the intervening years, so police had to contact Canadian authorities to help obtain fingerprints and a DNA sample from the man. Detectives in Washington also re-examined all of Leah's belongings, hoping 
to find DNA on them. Because again, you know, by this point, DNA technology had advanced. And so right. they were hoping that, you know, they were, they would be able to find things that they couldn't have found back in 2000. The most promising items from her car were articles of clothing that they sent to the FBI lab. Now, as you can imagine, guilty or innocent, the mysterious second man wasn't super e- eager to give up his fingerprints and DNA. And again, you're dealing with a different country, so there's a right. lot of red tape involved with that. So it took over two years for police to obtain the samples, but they did. But once they did, they were met with disappointment. The fingerprints were not a match. However, in the spring of 2010, there was some good news. Male DNA was found on some of Leah's belongings, and I believe it was an article of clothing. The episode of Disappeared aired in 2011, and they were still waiting to find out if the DNA found was a match to the Canadian man. However, it's been nearly 13 years since then, and there has never been a public update one way or another about the DNA. Did they not have his DNA? No, they were able to get it after two years. So basically, the way the episode of Disappeared ends is with the cops saying like, yeah, it took us two years. We got the fingerprints. We got the DNA. The fingerprints didn't match. But we are checking his DNA against the male DNA that we were able to pull from an item in the car. And that's it. That's how it ends. And there has never, ever been a public update given by the police. So do you think that they're keeping it close to the vest, maybe because it was a match, but there's not, that's not really evidence of any wrongdoing, foul play, there's no body. Well, I mean, it is, though, because, like, according to the man, he was never in Leah's car. Like, there was no reason for his DNA to have been on anything of hers. Right. But what I'm saying is that, that that's not enough to like arrest the guy sure so that's why they haven't publicly said it is or is not a match yeah i i do find it interesting though that they also never identified him right and i have to think that if the dna was a match Mm -hmm. that they would have wanted to at least name him as a suspect because or a person of interest you know however you want to do it right because then you put his picture out there you say hey this guy talked to her in the mall at this restaurant you know blah 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 and then maybe people know something maybe somebody who knows this guy is like oh yeah i saw him with a woman that day or the next day or the next week or you know whatever it was like you could generate tips out of that but if the dna wasn't a match then obviously it makes sense to not put his name out there because at this point, for all you know, he's just some guy who happened to be sitting at a bar. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I do find it strange, though, that if the DNA wasn't a match, that they wouldn't wouldn't have just said that. just say that, yeah. Yeah. But there's more weirdness with, like, tight-lippedness with this case that we're going to get into. Another thing that the second set of detectives assigned to Leah's case did was perform additional searches of the area where the Jeep was found. And now, again, this is several years later by this point. Right. So, I mean, like, what what do they think they're going to find? Well, they're hoping to find her body. Yeah. yeah. Because they're still kind of working under the assumption that she either did get ejected from the car and was somehow missed Mm -hmm. during the initial investigation or just something else happened to her out there. And they went out with metal detectors because she had that rod in her leg. Oh, yeah. So that's really kind of what they were hoping to find. Mm. Because, you know, with bones, like bones can scatter and and who knows. But um, if you've got metal detectors and a rod and a femur, yeah, you have a better chance of finding it. So nothing was turned up in these new searches. But in 2014, something big was found in the area. And this is tough because this is like where things just get very internet focused and like I don't have a lot of third party sources on this, but according to a 2017 Reddit post by user Vice Admiral Obvious, in 2014 a mummified body was found in the same region that Leah's Jeep was found. Unfortunately, the link for the source that the poster used. So, you know, so basically he made this post. It's like, hey, there's this weird coincidence in the Leah Roberts case. And he posted a link to this mummified body that was found. Right. But the link is dead now. So I can't see the source. 
So I don't know what they mean by the same region, like how close it actually was. Yeah. Um, but I do believe it was in Whatcom County. Listen, a body being found in the mountains isn't exactly earth shattering and, you know, could very easily have nothing to do with Leah. But get this. The remains that were found had a metal rod in the right femur, just like Leah. The rod was traced to its lot number, and that batch was apparently shipped in 1998, which fits with the time frame of when she would have gotten the rod placed in her. Now, the body was also identified as being five foot five, and Leah was five foot six, so not exactly, but pretty close, damn close. close enough, yeah. But here's the catch. The body was identified as being male between the ages of 33 and 55. Leah was, of course, a 23-year-old female. Now, I bring up this Reddit post instead of actual source material because in addition to like that link being broken, I could not find any original sources on this. Like, I couldn't find any newspaper articles. I couldn't find anything. You know, I'm not saying that to say that this p person was making the story up because there was a NamUs page for these remains and there was a NamUs case number. Okay. And this NamUs case number and page was referred to by other posters and other forums. So like, yes, it's still all random people on the internet, but like multiple people saw the NamUs entry. But I couldn't go to the NamUs page because it now cannot be seen. This will often indicate that the person has been identified because NamUs, for those of you who don't know, is a database for unidentified people. So it's either people who have gone missing, mm -hmm. who have not been found, or it's for unidentified bodies, or in some cases, unidentified living people. So in these databases, all of their vital statistics are put in. And basically, it's a tool to help match up these unidentified bodies with missing people. Mm -hmm. So this page, this case number, you can, if you put the case number into NamUs, it does not come up anymore. And that does, like I said, typically mean that the person's been identified because once they're identified, they don't need to be in the system anymore. But... I also wasn't able to find any news articles or anything else about the remains being identified or being found in the first place. So this could be completely made up and not. Well, no, because again, like again, like there is a NamUs case number and multiple people did say at the time mm. back in like, you know, 2014, 2015, you know, in those subsequent years, it was up and it was up for actually several years, apparently, as I'm about to get to, because on April 12th, 2022, a Web Sleuths user by the name of Hmm Mysterious posted that they had been in contact with the regional program specialist for the John Doe, for the body that was found. The NamUs rep said that they were looking into both Leah and a man named Benjamin Munoz as possibility for the identity of the remains. Now, Munoz went missing in Washington in 2011 and also had a metal implant. It seems to be that it would be more than likely him since the remains were male, alleged, right. allegedly. But on April 21st, 2022, so so this post uh, was on April 12th. On April 21st, the Web Sleuths user posted that the NamUs page for the John Doe was gone, which again, okay, they were looking into possibly identifying him. Maybe they did. But both Leah and Ben Munoz's pages are still up. Mm indicating that it wasn't either of them, if in fact those remains were identified. So what happened to Leah Roberts? Was the man from Canada responsible for her disappearance and possible murder? If so, why plan such an elaborate car crash and then hide the body? Does the DNA found on the item in the car belong to him, or was that another dead end? If the Jeep crash was truly an accident, why was there no sign of anyone being injured? Was it used as a shelter after the crash, or were the covered windows another red herring? Because we don't have any other hotel information from Leah. Right. I was going to say that. I was thinking that maybe she was sleeping in her car. Yeah. And, and had put, put that up for privacy. Yeah, well before the crash. Right. And then just didn't bother to take it down and just was driving around like that. Yeah. 
And I mean, that's my personal belief. Like, I don't believe that anybody, like Leah or anybody else, was using that Jeep as a shelter after the crash. So if she was in a car accident, though, could she have sustained a head injury that made her disoriented enough to forget who she was, but not injure her in any way that would have drawn blood? Also the cat. Also the cat. And so, but even if that's the case, even if she miraculously had a bad head injury, but not a scratch on her. Or at least not a scratch from when she was inside the car. Right. Like, what happened to her afterwards? Did she actually end up 60 miles away in Everett? Is she still out there somewhere today? Or did she randomly survive this car crash and then meet with foul play afterwards? But the the car, the engine had been tampered with, too. Right. But was it really? Or was that just misinterpreted? So what do you think? Like, based on every random weird thing that I've thrown at you, like, what do you think happened? I don't know. I mean, so, yeah, the sheets up over the windows, definitely, like, she was sleeping in her car. Mm -hmm. Probably to save money. It's part of the Kerouac road trip Right, right. Yeah, you're not staying at a Best Western. The fact that the car was tampered with and that there was no blood or any indication that she was in the car or using the seatbelt makes me think that it was staged, especially considering yeah. the cat carrier was in the car, but no cat. Again, seeming no, seemingly no evidence that the cat got injured in the, in the crash right. also. Yeah. So yeah, I don't, again, I don't, if, it, if you have like, let's just say that the cat wasn't in the carrier at the time of the car crash and was just like in the car for some reason. There, there would have been, you would have been able to tell, I feel like. Yeah. You know? Right. Or even, and obviously if the cat was in the carrier, the cat would be there. Yeah. I don't think she or the cat were in the car at the time of the crash. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty obvious. What, ha why would she stage this? I don't know. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like, why? She was and already on a, on a road trip that nobody really knew about. So it's not, you know. Yeah. Like why? go to such elaborate lengths to stage your own disappearance when you already just disappeared. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, but, but the thing that troubles me about that is, did she have the knowledge to tamper with the car in that way? It doesn't seem like she would. Right. And so, okay, then if it's a third party, why? Like, if you're just, like, some random murderer, like, why are you going to then go through all of this trouble? Right, when you could just leave the car somewhere. Yeah. Like, on the side of the road. Because, or... you know, she's in Washington State, which, by all accounts, like, she's never been to before. She doesn't know anybody there. There's nobody there who has ties to Leah. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you just leave the car, you just leave the body, like, nobody's going to tie it to you, you know, unless you leave like physical evidence behind or whatever. Like you don't need to stage some weird elaborate car wreck. Yeah. And then, you know, another theory that I, that somebody posited at, you know, on something was like, maybe there was a third party, but that person, like she asked somebody to help her stage this, but like, why again, why would somebody do that? Right. And if they would do it, why would they do it for free? Because there was $2,400 in cash, like, in the car. Right. And even if it was, like, again, foul play, why would they leave $2,400 in cash? Right. Why wouldn't they make it look like a robbery or something? Yeah. I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So after doing, you know, after researching this and kind of, like, going through everything, I still don't understand the crash itself. Like, I still do think that there's... Like, I can't find any explanation for that. Like, why do this elaborate crash that makes sense? Because I agree, it does seem staged. Like, I also don't believe that she was in the car when it crashed. No explanation makes sense to me on that. But there are three things about the accident scene that do strike me. The clothing at the top of the road, especially if they were tied to the trees, but even if they were just hanging from the trees. That, to me, indicates that somebody wanted the wreck to be found. They right. were drawing attention to that area, to that wreck. Then there's the cat food and the cat carrier, but no cat. If Leah crashed her car and maybe decided to end her life, 
I could see her letting B go into the woods, perhaps with a romanticized idea that she would live freely. Mm -hmm. Then there's the ring found underneath the floor mat. Everyone said Leah never took that ring off. But if she were planning on taking her life, maybe she wanted to ensure that the ring would get back to her family. So she put it in the car for safekeeping. But if she ended her own life, where is the body? Exactly. Because if you kill yourself, you can't hide your own body. But so, also, if you're ending your own life, why go through this elaborate thing with the car again? It could be some situation of I'm destroying everything that tied me to this earth. You know, she's crashing her car, all of her stuff's in it. She's kind of just wrecking everything that she had in this body, in this like plane of existence. So it could be symbolic in that way. But again, this just seem this does just seem like a very intricate way, an overly complicated way of going about that. Yeah. The fact that her body wasn't found. So All right. You know, if those mummified remains were perhaps misidentified, which has happened before, I mean, height has been wrong, age has been wrong, gender has been wrong, you know, especially when you're talking about mummified remains, there could be actual explanations for that. But it does appear as though those remains were identified. And it wasn't Leah. So the only explanation would be that somehow she is out there and just hasn't been found. And, you know, police did think that that was a possibility because many years later, in 2006, 2007, like they did go back out there and search because they thought, yeah, maybe she is still out there. And keep in mind, we are talking about Washington State. We're talking about a very dense forest. And not only that, this area basically has snow all of the time. Mm. And so there's a chance that she could have been covered by snow or something along those lines and that could have kept her from being found and then you know sometime in between the first search the initial searches and when they went out several years later you know animals like she could have just been scattered i got nothing else i mean i really don't none of it makes any sense to me. yeah i mean it's tough because the other thing that i go back to with suicide is The fact that in that note, she wrote, no, I'm not suicidal. Right. Which like just seems like a weird thing for a not suicidal person to write. Right. That in itself to me is an indication that there was a reason to worry about her. And, you know, Kara was worried about her, right? Like even though Leah seemingly left of her own volition and nobody ever thought that she didn't, like nobody ever thought she was like forced to leave or anything like that. Kara was very worried because of her mental state, from what it sounds like. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to put words in Kara's mouth or anything like that, but it does seem like there was more going on there. Regardless of what happened to Leah, Leah Roberts' family has dealt with more than their fair share of tragedy and loss. Hopefully one day, more publicity and more interest in Leah's case will bring some of these answers to light. Roberts has been missing from Whatcom County, Washington since March 13, 2000, when she was last seen by witnesses and surveillance video. She last had contact with her loved ones on March 9, 2000. Leah is a white woman with sandy blonde hair and blue eyes. She was 5'6 and approximately 130 pounds at the time of her disappearance. She was 23 when she went missing. She would be 47 today. Anyone with information concerning the whereabouts of Leah Roberts is asked to contact the Detective Sergeant of the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office at 360-778-6600 or contact the Whatcom Communication Dispatch Center at 360-676-6711. You can see all the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and thentheywaregone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and TikTok. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. 
And then they were gone as hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research writing and editing is done by me, Kona Gallagher. The music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And then they were gone is a little monster production. <laughs> <laughs>